Hello everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about the limbic system. There will be very few questions today so everybody can relax. Now, this beautiful diagram from the British Grey's Anatomy shows almost the entire uh, limbic system outlined in yellow, and the complexity of it appears overwhelming. I made a list of all the structures involved in the limbic system. As you can see, there's a huge number of these structures. So how did it get to be so complicated? We, to the two terms, the limbic lobe and the limbic system. It started with, with the limbic lobe and progressed over many years into the uh, term, the limbic system. Now, this whole process started by the French uh, physician, anatomist, and anthropologist Broca, who coined the term le grand lobe limbique, which means a border. Now, when I looked on the, online on the internet, there was a, a huge number of drawings and pictures of what people uh, said was the limbic lobe, the limbic system. They, they were very inconsistent, and a lot more was described as being the limbic lobe than actually it was the case. So I went way back. The amazing thing about the internet, you can go way back, I went to the French version of, of Google, and I found the, or, the original article by Broca. And I want to read this line, the few lines here, which uh, the French sounds almost like English. He says in this talk from 1878 that the great limbic lobe is, par is composed of three parts. The, the, the convolution that surrounds the corpus callosum is the first part, which is the superior arc, and then the second part is the limb, is the hippocampus, which forms the inferior arc, and the third part of the arc is the olfactory lobe, which forms the, the anterior part. So he only mentioned three, three segments. It's interesting that Dr. Kumar, who has a, a very interesting slideshow on the internet, was the only one who really described uh, accurately what Broca talked about, the singular, the hippocampus, and the, limb, the olfactory system. However, he did not only mention in the writing here, he mentions only a singular and the hippocampus. The olfactory part is the key because uh, Broca was very interested in the olfactory system and its changes during evolution. So what is the limbic system in its latest uh, version? It consists of phylogenetically older part of the cerebral hemisphere together with adjacent uh, regions that, and their connection to the subcortical regions. It's not a discrete anatomically circumscribed system of pathways, but rather a combination of close and functionally associated cortical area and nuclei. And although there were all kinds of theories over the years about the function of the limbic system, including emotion, which uh, turned out not to be the case, it's now considered like another term for it is the visceral brain. It's involved in olfaction, spatial memory, motor learning, attention, and vigilance. That's the latest uh, concept, what the limbic system is involved with. Now here's again the list that I made, and you can see the huge amount of structures that are part of the limbic system. Because of the complexity of the topic, I try to limit myself to only the structures that we can visualize uh, by MR. I was amused to see this statement 
and the, rec the neuroradiology requisite, which says the limbic system anatomy is enough to lead you to think that its primary purpose is to make you nuts. After working on this, I have to agree with this statement and also add that I feel you have to be nuts to, to even attempt to talk about it because of the complexity involved. Now, to see the complex anatomy of the limbic system, especially in the temporal low part, you cannot see that region when you look just at the medial side of the brain because everything is obscured by the brain stem. Uh, and you can see here the specimen I dissected where I removed the brain stem, and we now can see the uh, inner surface of the temporal lobe with some of the structures involved in the, in the limbic system. Now I'm going to start with the olfactory system. As you can see, I listed it first. I already talked a little bit last week about the olfactory system when I talked about the hypoglossal nerve. So again, if we look in here, we have the olfactory bulb, the olfactory tract, then we have the important olfactory stria, the anterior perforate substance, then there's the diagonal band of Broca, which we cannot see, and then very important piriform lobe, which is hidden within the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. The only way to see it is to really kind of pull the temporal lobe laterally and expose this area, which is also called a piriform lobe, uh, which consists of all these different gyri and bands, which we really cannot see on MR. This is a very fascinating topic of how the olfactory system got wedged into this medial area of the temporal lobe, and I'll be talking about it when I talk about the evolution of the brain in possibly my next talk. Then we have the important rhinal sulcus, which I'll also discuss in my next talk. Now, as I showed last week, we can see the olfactory bulb, we can see on MR, we can see the olfactory tract. And also, Dr. Kassam and his group have shown nicely the olfactory tract and bulb on a sagittal MR, as you can see here. We can even see the olfactory fiber coming through the cribriform plate. Quite remarkable. And he also shows on the axial view the olfactory bulb here, the olfactory tract, and also the, the lateral and medial olfactory stria, and also the intermediate one. But this is really as far as we can go with the imaging of the olfactory system so far. And we can see in this diagram the tremendous complexity of the various cerebral connections of the olfactory system, some of which I'll talk about later. Now, over the years there have been many attempts to classify the limbic system uh, you know, the phylogenetic, anatomic, but uh, in the modern era of MR, the system devised by uh, Leighton Mark and his colleagues uh, David Daniels and also Tom Natick divided the, the limbic system or part of it into a series of arches, also called arcs or curves, I like to use the term arcs because that's really what Broca used. So we have now four arcs here, and I'll describe them separately and the structures involved uh, in each of these arcs. So you can see that one of them is the parahippocampal gyrus, the singular gyrus, then there's a sulcus, then there's the hippocampus proper, so we'll go through all these arches separately. But this had simplified the whole system of talking about the limbic, a part of the limbic system. So let's start with the 
the first outer ring, which is, consists of the cingulate gyrus, the isthmus of the cingulate gyrus, the parahippocampal gyrus, and the uncus. And we can see here, it's also, some people call it the neocortical ring or arc. So again, we can see on this brain the cingulum, the region of the isthmus, and then the medial surface of temporal lobe, which is the parahippocampal gyrus, and then the uncus is over here. And this is uh, fairly easy to see on MR. Again, we have the cingulate gyrus here, and, and also we can see the region of the cingulate above the corpus callosum on the coronal MR uh, as well. And we can also identify the cingulate gyrus on DTIs. And you can see here, uh, here it is in green because of the anterior posterior direction of the fibers and, and more anteriorly when the curves around this curve here around the genu of the corpus callosum we see it over here and then it fades away lower down and again posteriorly we can see because of the curving as it fades away and here on coronal DTI we could also make it up here's the here are the two singular uh, gyri above the corpus callosum, again green because of the anteroposterior direction, and the corpus callosum red because of the side-to-side -side fibers direction. And people have even, uh, these authors have done uh, tractography of the corpus of the singular gyrus, as you can see here, in orange and describe the method where they have seeding areas uh, along the where the FA was appropriate for the singular gyrus and then tra made the tracking and then combined it into the single singular gyrus track. And here's another attempt of outlining the singular gyrus. Okay, now let's move on to the isthmus of the singular gyrus. The isthmus is a narrow area of connection between the singular gyrus and the parahippocampal gyrus. And here we can see it on a uh, MR, this thinning of the cortical connection between the two gyri. And we can also identify it on the coronal plane. So this is the region of the isthmus cingulate. Here it is on, on an MR. You can see it here. And on the axial plane, it's outlined over here. And we can see it right here, just lateral to the <coughs> collicular plate or the quadrigeminal plate. What is the structure I'm pointing to with the arrow? Correct. As asif right away, but is that normal? Because if we look at the brain here, there should be nothing between the superior surface of the vermis and the splenium of the corpus callosum, but we do have a structure here. So, as Asif said, this is the isthmus singularly. However, there's a, a little anomaly here. We can see on the coronal plane that there's some tissue projecting medially. Sometimes there's a defect in the junction of the falks with the tentorium, and some and the, some of the brain will herniate mainly the area of the isthmus singular into the, the midline here. And that's why we see it over here projecting between the vermis and the splenium. And here it is on the axial plane. Again, this is the region of the isthmus singular projecting. And here we can see on the, on the post-contrast image, here it is projecting into the midline in comparison to the normal. And here it is on the flare and on the T2. 
So again, there's a defect in the tentorium or the inferior fox tentorial junction. And here's another case showing the same thing, tissue be which should not be there, again, because of a defect. And here's a, an another anomaly where not only does the isthmus project medially, but also a portion of the lingual gyrus of the occipital lobe, so both of the structures project medially because of a defect in the Fox centorial junction. And here's an interesting case that I, I had. The patient had a stroke, and again, we can see the small stroke here, but this is in the region of the isthmus singularly, as you can see the, ex the proximity to where the isthmus is. Okay, so we've talked about the first arch, the singular hippocampal arch. Now let's move to the other arch, the hippocampal arch, the temporal segment of that arch, which is uh, which we can see here uh, outlined in yellow. Now what are the components of this arch? There's the hippocampus, the dentate, the subiculum, then there's the supercolossal hippocampus, and uh, inducium grisium, and the paratemal gyrus, which I will not talk about now. We can see that the hippocampus has a bunch of other names, Ammon's horn, corneal ammon, uh, aminus, passive hippocampi. Hippo hippo All these names, the literature has, has been very difficult to, to uh, grab to grasp what they're talking about because there's so many different names. And Dr. Bronin uh, wrote a paper where he summarized the terminology and tried to put some order into the various names. And it was very helpful, as you can see, he talked about the hippocampal terminology and also talked about the limbic system and the various names for the same structure. So this is very helpful. Okay, now, what are we looking at? Here's a, a, a dissection looking at the temporal lobe uh, structures. Anteriorly, here's the amygdala. Then we have a segment here of the temporal horn. And here's the hippocampus. The head of the hippocampus, the body, and the tail. The curves here behind the central uh, basal ganglia and thalamic structures. And here it is on MR, amygdala, a little bit of the temple horn, and the head of the hippocampus, sagittal MR. Now, again, as I said before, if you look at this anatomic diagram from above, the head of the hippocampus, the body, and the tail. Again, amygdala, head of the hippocampus, body, and tail on the sagittal plane. Now, the important practical images are always in the coronal. So if we go from front to back, this is the amygdala here, the head of the hippocampus, the body, and the tail. And later I'll go through the details of the structures. So here again, we have the tail, the body, and the hippocampal head with the digitations. Now, one of the important thing is to, and here it is again, uh, we can see it uh, on, on the T2, again, the tail, the body, and the head. And this was on a T1 image. Now, one of the difficulties is to separate the amygdala from the hippocampal head. I find the easiest way to separate the two is to look where the CSF of the temporal horn is. So, for instance, here's the amygdala. You can see on the specimen, here's the amygdala, which is basically a basal ganglia structure that during evolution was pushed down into the temporal lobe. So we can see the amygdala, 
and the temple horn is squeezed underneath it. So if we look at the MR here, here's the amygdala with the temple horn below it. Here we have both amygdala above and the temple uh, head here. And then notice that the temple horn is above the hippocampus here. So the position of the temple horn helps you determine what exactly you're looking at. So this is amygdala with the temple horn below and the hippocampus with the temple horn above it. It's easier, of course, on the axial plane. I just rotated this anatomic specimen. So this is the amygdala, temple horn, and the hippocampal head here. And here on the MR, area of the amygdala, temple horn, and hippocampus behind. Now, we have to delve into the complex anatomy of the hippocampus. So we're looking at a coronal brain specimen, and there's some important structures which we'll have to get into. First of all, there's this collateral sulcus, a very important structure as you'll see, because it separates the parahippocampal gyrus and the medial aspect, this is the medial aspect of the brain, from the, the lateral occipotemporal gyrus, also called the fusiform gyrus, and then more laterally, the inferior temporal gyrus. So here we have the temporal horn. This is the choroidal fissure here. And then below it, we have the structures of the hippocampus, the fimbria, and alvus I'll talk about later. Then there's a the section, the hippocampus proper, the dentate, which I'll mention later. And then we have this transitional cortex. Remember, the neocortex is made of three layer, of six layers. And then there's a the transitional cortex, which is called the subiculum. And then we get into the hippocampal structures, which are really a, a more ancient uh, th three-layered cortex. And then we have the hippocampal sulcus, which I'll talk about later here. Now, where did the term hippocampus come? Hippocampus means a seahorse or sea monster, actually. And people thought it looked very much like this, like the tail of the seahorse. Uh, I actually found this picture of a lizard, of a iguana on this international wildlife on the cover, also showing this kind of curly cute tail. So it's another example in nature. Uh, anyway, that's how the name hippocampus came. So when, if we look at this beautiful diagram of anatomic specimens, again, we can identify the structure. The white matter, the fimbrian alveus, we have then the hippocampus proper, the dentate. The hippocampus proper and the dentate are like two uh, nested, two sea arches which make up the hippocampus here. Then we have an S here, the subiculum, and then the parahippocampal gyrus. Notice that on MR, on even a 3T, we, we can only see a little bit of the detail here. We may see actually the region of the dentate, but not very clearly. And we can even see the area of the subiculum here. Uh, but the detail is still not, has a long way to go. There's some images on the 7T, which again, do not show the anatomy as clearly seen on, on an anatomic specimen. But still, we can identify a few things. And here is a study done on the A Tesla with anatomic specimen, and we can see that uh, these are the images of this anatomic specimen done in a very small bore scanner. And here are the MR images. And you can see, again, the detail is not, not at all uh, what the anatomic specimen show. And it, because of the formalin, there's issue with the signal-to-noise ratio on the, T, on the T1 and T2 images. 
and they talk about uh, which is the best technique, but still a ways to go. Okay, now we will frequently, when we look at a Mars, we will see these lexistic structures inside the region of the hippocampus. These are normal variants and relate to the development of the hippocampus. What is the problem with this patient? Anybody, what's the diagnosis? Correct, as Gino said, what's overall did the problem? It just, Gino said, the hippocampus does not look normal. And as Ben just said, there's agenesis, the classic findings of agenesis of the corpus callosum. And one of the findings in agenesis of the corpus callosum is a malrotation or incomplete infolding of the hippocampi. Now, how did this happen to come about? Early in evolution and, and also in embryology, the hippocampus is basically a linear structure with the, with the dentate, the hippocampus proper, the subiculum, and the parahippocampal gyrus are like in a continual sheet. Then during evolution, uh, which I will talk about next time, there's infolding of the structures of the hippocampus and you end up with these two C nested with the dentate, the hippocampus, and the subiculum and the classic uh, adult arrangement. And here it again, shown again diagrammatically how the infolding occurs and the arrow points to the hippocampal sulcus or hippocampal fissure that ends up in adult between the dentate and the subiculum. Now, I was interested in looking at how this happened, and I scanned a number of uh, fe intact fetal specimen on a specially special program on the MR scanner, and here's a 13-week fetus, and this is an 18-week, and if we look at the hippocamp, here's the hippocampus totally unfolded. Here's the temple horn, uh, and we can see that the hippocampus is, has kind of a linear appearance. However, by 18 weeks, we have more of the normal appearance with the infolding of the dentate and the hippocampus. Again, we see the temple horn here and the germal matrix. So notice how similar in this patient the unfolded hippocampus is to how it appears here on the specimen I x-rayed the 13 week. So this is really incomplete uh, infolding of the hippocampus. And here is a specimen I dissected of the 14-week fetal specimen, again showing the unfolded hippocampus. And here is a very prominent hippocampal fissure, or sulcus, which we can also see here on the MR of the patient. Again, this is the hippocampus, and the temple horn uh, is this little space here. It's a coronal view, just like in this coronal MR. So what happened here is that sometimes there's not complete obliteration of the olfactory of the hippocampal sulcus, and you end up with the little cyst or remnants of the hippocampal sulcus with a little bit of CSF in them. Uh, as we can see on this M axial MRs. Okay, so we've talked about uh, the hippocampus proper, the dentate, the subiculum. Now we have to move to the supercolossal segment of the hippocampus. That is the supercolossal hippocampal gyrus, also known as the indusium grisium, and the parathermal gyrus which is sitting here above the corpus callosum. So this is another one of the rings. Now, how did it happen that the hippocampus 
which is basically a temporal lobe structure, is also sitting above the corpus callosum. So again, this is where the uh, supercallosal hippocampus, also known as supercallosal gyrus, or indusium grisium. To understand how that happened, we have to understand the evolutionary changes of the brain and also in embryology, which I'll go in much more detail in my next talks. But here we have, in evolution and very early in embryology, the hippocampus is a massively large structure occupying a large portion of the brain. The, hip, the corpus callosum develops within this hippocampal structure, and later on, when the hip, corpus callosum is fully developed, there's a small ring of hippocampal tissue left above it. And so that's the supercallosal hippocampus. It's an evolutionary uh, development. So what do we have above the corpus callosum? If we look at this beautiful diagram again by Netter, we have the indusium grisium, which is, again, the remnant of the hippocampus of the hippocampus above the corpus callosum, which is very rudimentary in humans, and it's just the very narrow layers lying above the corpus callosum. We can see it outlined here in green, and here's this, an, 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 this anatomic specimen from the literature. We can see this little reddish. This is the indusium grisium over, overlying over the corpus callosum, and here it is again. Now, why bother? We have to bother with it because we can see it on MR. Here is the outline on a specimen, uh, but we can see this thin white layer here. That's the indusium grisium. It's in white because the white matter is, is white here. I'm s and here's from the literature showing this thin gray layer. This is the indusium grisium in a coronal view above the corpus callosum. And I was also proud of myself that I found, you see a little bit of gray here. This is the indusium grisium, or the supercallosal hippocampus above in a coronal view, above the corpus callosum. So it's, a, it's identifiable. And here's this author showed the variations in the, in the supercallosal hippocampus. Sometimes you have two areas. Sometimes it's combined into a single area. Sometimes it's lateral, as you can see here, and sometimes it's only in, in the midline. Now, here's a case where we have this a very, very thin lipoma surrounding the, the splenum of the corpus callosum, almost it, like it happened uh, within the indusium griseum as it goes around the spleen of the corpus callosum. Okay, we now have to proceed. So we talked about the indusium grisium here. As it moves anteriorly, it becomes the parterminal gyrus. So again, on this diagram, indusium grisium, supercallosal hippocampus, it then travels underneath the genu of the corpus callosum and becomes a Paraterminal gyrus, which then continues as a diagonal band of Barocca back into the temporal lobe. So, this is the paraterminal gyrus. And here's a dissection I did of the medial surface of the brain, and we can actually identify the paraterminal gyrus over here. And we can, I wasn't really sure exactly the separation between that and the, the lamina rostralis of the genu. But we, this would be the struct, this would be its location. So this is the paraterminal gyrus, part of the supercallosal hippocampus. While we're talking in, about this region, we have to talk about a very important limbic region. That is the septal area, also known as subcallosal area or the parallelfactory area. The reason that's so important is that this region, which I outlined here in this dissected specimen, uh, 
This is the septal region, which is basically outlined by a posterior olfactory sulcus, which we can see here, and anterior olfactory sulcus. So this is the septal region, also known as the subcolossal region or the perolfactory area. And here it is on MR. So this is the septal area. See, you can see it right over here. The reason that's so important because this region uh, except, uh, has reciprocal connections from the olfactory bulb, the hippocampus, amygdala, hypothalamus, thalamus, cingular gyra, benula, and the midbrain. So there's a relay station and it's a very important area of the uh, limbic system. Okay, now let's move on to another arc, the alveus fimbria and the fornix arc, in blue here. This diagram from above shows the hippocampus from above. The alveus is in red. Now, the alveus is the white matter of the hippocampus. It's very interesting that the white matter in the hippocampus is on the surface, just like in the in the spinal cord. You know, in the spinal cord, the gray is in the center and the white matter is on the outside. The hippocampus is an extremely old evolutionary structure and is somewhat similar where the white matter is on the outside and the gray is on the inside. Now, the white matter fibers start out initially as a layer called the alveus. Those, then the fibers tra travel into a thicker area, the fimbria. And then the fimbria eventually will become the fornix. Can we see all this complexity? Yes, we can on MR. So again, here's a sagittal view of the hippocampus. There's a thin layer here. This is the alveus or fim over here. And notice, if we look at this T1 MR, sagittal MR, here's the hippocampus. This white layer is the alveus. Uh, the, and the fimbria, so the white matter of the hippocampus, and on the T2 is this dark line. We notice, for instance, that we can see quite a bit of anatomy here of the hippocampus. Maybe eventually we'll be able to separate the dentate, which is central, from the uh, hippocampal proper uh, because we're getting pretty close on these images. You can see the detail inside the hippocampus. Now, of course, the coronal is what clinically we always look at. So look at the specimen here. The white here is the alveus, and then centrally will be the, the fimbria. And we can see it nicely here. On the T2, it's a dark line. That's a white matter of the hippocampus, the alveus, and centrally is the fimbria. Again, on the T1, notice the white area, that's the alveus and fimbria. So that's in the region of the hippocampal head. In the region of the hippocampal body, we have the alveus, and, and this is the fimbria, the collection of the fiber on the medial surface. And here again, white is the alveus, and this is the fimbria. Again, black on T2, the alveus, and the fimbria, a little bunched up area right here. And then we get to the tail, we again, the alveus and the fimbria, and we can see it on coronal MR on the T1. Here's the alveus, the fimbria, and on T2, alveus and fimbria very similar to what we see on this anatomic specimen, the alveus and the fimbria over here. I reversed the image so it matched the MR. What happens next is as the fibers travel beyond this region, they become part of the fornix. So this is the beginning of the crew of the fornix. Let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the fornix. So the fornix uh, starts as the 
Fimbria in the region of the hippocampus and then travels uh, here superiorly, becomes the crua of the fornix. Then we have the commissure of the fornix, the body of the fornix, and then anterior the columns, which end up in the mammillary bodies, as we can see over here. So this is the cruis, the, cru the posterior structure of the crura of the, of the uh, fornix. And here we can look from above, uh, again, the structures with the hippocampus, alveus frimbia, the crura, the body, and we don't see the columns because they're hidden here. And here's the section I did, again, showing th this is the fimbria here becoming the crura of the hippocampus, I mean, of the fornix, then tra becoming the fornix over here, the body region is here. This just showed the dente gyrus as it kind of goes posteriorly and eventually will become the, uh, the uh, inducing griseum. So again, can we, why bother? Because we can see it on MR. So here are the crura of the fornix, and here we can see in the, just at the level of the splenium, these are the crura of the fornix. Remember, it's white matter, dark on T2. This was an interesting case. One of the last cases that I read out was Rob, uh, before he left, patient presented with transient global amnesia. And notice there was a tiny stroke in the region of the crura of the, of the fornix, explaining the amnesia because of the memory issues that the tracks of the fornix. And notice here on the sagittal images, we see the fornix as it travels anteriorly, becomes a column, and ends up in the mammillary body. Note this beautiful depiction on a sagittal T1MR. So here's the fornix posteriorly, the region of the body, and here it is curving anteriorly, curving. This is the columns in front or behind the, the anterior commissure, traveling all the way down towards the area of the mammillary body. And this is a very important tract, the mammillary thalamic tract that I'll mention later again. So again, we can see it on the specimen, beautifully demonstrated on MR. And again, also on the T2, we can see these structures. Here's the fornix, the crura, and the area of the commissure. And notice again, as it travels anteriorly, it comes way down here behind the, the anterior commissure, all the way down to the level of the mammillary body. Again, seen here also important part of the limbic system. So again, I mentioned before, this is the columns of the fornix. This is the mammillary thalamic tract, which we can see both on the T2 and on the T1. This is a very important structure of the limbic system because the fibers go in it from the mammillary body to the anterior and anterior thalamus, where there's tremendous connection with the singular gyrus, with the, with the hippocampal formation. It's an important relay station for the limbic system. Again, we can identify part of it here on MR. And again, if we look at coronal views of the fornix, we, when we go from back, so here are the, here are the crura, more anteriorly, we get into the area of the commissure. Here's the body where the two of them are connected. Then here is again the body of the fornix. And here notice the columns coming down towards the mammillary body. Now, the fibers usually split at the level of the anterior commissure and the larger post-commissural fibers and some small fibers anteriorly they go into the septal region uh, if just the split occurs around the anterior commissure. And again, we can see all this uh, on a coronal T2. Again, the area of the body. And again, notice we can see the, co the columns coming down towards the mammillary bodies. <laughs>
And this was a very interesting case sent to me by a former fellow, Ian. This was a patient who had a history of, didn't remember, constantly asking the same questions. And again, notice there was a stroke involving the fornix. Look here, the body of the fornix, uh, and look at the high signal in the region of the mammillary. Uh, again, the fornix being involved. What's the abnormality in this patient? What's the underlying disease? What structures are involved? Correct, the mammillary bodies. What usually involves the mammillary bodies? As Anshu said, also, high signal, even enhanced. What condition causes that? Correct. As Gino said, Wernicke's, Korsakov, Anshu said, and the underlying condition in this in these diseases is what? What is deficient? Correct. As Gino said, the resident said, everybody said vitamin thiamine deficiency. This patient was acute lymphocytic leukemia had severe, I remember we checked it, it was tremendously low uh, thiamine levels. Okay, while we're talking about this phonix, let's talk about another structure, the anterior commissure, which we can identify nicely on axial MRs. The anterior commissure is a very important uh, commissure connecting the olfactory medial parts of the temple lobe uh, it goes from side to side and easily identifiable on an atomic specimen as well as an MR. So here it is, just in front of the fornices. And here we can see, because it slopes down, we will only see part of it uh, on different sections. So here is centrally and then more laterally. On T2, we can also identify it on axial T1, centrally and more laterally. Here on a coronal view, a specimen showing it, we can see it again on a coronal T2, the arc of the anterior commissure more laterally. And of course, we can also identify it on DTI. Uh, here it is in red because of right to left, and here it is changing a little color because of the curvature, and we can follow it more laterally. Now it's interesting, we can, because of its structure, we can identify it nicely, of course, in the midline cuts, but we can also see it laterally, more laterally here, for instance, here it is in the specimen, and here we can see it. Here's a series that I just put up of just a regular T2 image, a sagittal image on a 1.5 uh, machine. And look, you can follow it all the way from centrally all, you can see it all the way laterally uh, going all the way, all, then you kind of lose it close to the level of the hippocampus. So it can be easily followed on sagittal images. One, e when you see these uh, perivascular spaces, that's usually where the anterior commissure will be sitting, right at that level. Now here's an interesting case where I show, found where there was a large a glioma involving the basal ganglia, and we can see the deformity. Here's a normal anterior commissure, and here it is deformed, displaced by this mass lesion seen uh, on the T2 as well as in the flare images. And again, Here's an example where people did tractography of the entire fornix uh, on, on this outline in green here. And again, just the method they used for seeding and then outlining it. And here's another attempt where they did the fornix as well, the anterior commissure, as we can see faintly here on these green lines. Again, the fornix in orange and green is the anterior commissure. 
what's wrong here? A genesis the corpus callosum, and this is a lo enlarged anterior commissure. The callosal fibers, when there's no corpus callosum to go through, will sometimes go through the anterior commissure, enlarging it in size. So that's one of the pathways. For instance, here comparing to the normal, which is much smaller. Here's a case also of a lipoma, a genesis of the corpus callosum, again, a prominent anterior commissure. Here's another large anterior commissure, again because of the crossing colossal fibers in this case of agenesis from the literature. Okay, let's talk about the supercolossal fornix. You remember there's indusium graves in the gray matter that also tracks. There's the medial longitudinal stria and the lateral longitudinal stria, which are just the supercolossal fornix the fiber tracks going above, which uh, uh, we really, the anatomic specimen shows this little bump here of white matter. These are the stria, but have not been identified yet on MR. Let's talk about the last arc, and that is the hippocampal sulcus, colossal sulcus. If we look here at the anatomic specimen, this is the callosal sulcus between the geniculate and the corpus callosum, and this is the hippocampal sulcus within the hippocampus or the fissure. Is remember, do not mistake it for the for the choroidal fissure, which is above it. This is a continuous structure, as is shown here. It kind of continues as a continuous circle, callosal sulcus, and hippocampus sulcus, one continual circle. Okay, let's move on. What is this little calcification? Why am I bothering to show it? This is pineal calcification. Is this part of it or is this a separate structure? Anybody know what it's called? No. Okay, let me move on. Oh, sorry. Eric mentioned it. Habenula. Very good, Eric. This is calcification of the habenula commissure. Why am I pointing that out? It happens to be a very important limbic system structure. So this is the location here. It's attached to the pineal. Here it is on sagittal MR, this very faint line is the albenular commissure. The albenular commissure is these fibers, which are called the medullary stria of the thalamus, uh, these uh, originate in the olfactory system. They travel to the albenula, which is a relay station, and then, the fiber, then there's connections down into the brainstem. So these the, the sense of smell is very important because it connects with the gustatory nuclei, very important for origi originating the desire, you know, to, to eat and b based on the smell of the food and stuff. So this is the, the medullary stria of the thalamus, which then go to the habenular region. And notice how well we can identify. Here on the, you can see the pineal. These are the habenulae. And here we can see it on, on, uh, on the axial plane. Remember, this is the posterior commissure here, which is a little bit below it, and these are the habenular commissure over here, just in, originating from the pineal be, behind. Here again, these are the habenular haben, commissures in front of the posterior commissure. Again, posterior commissure here. Okay, the last structure that I want, I want to talk about, which is import, very important, is the enterorhinal cortex. How it ended up being s squeezed so immediately, I'll talk about uh, during my evolution talk, but there's tremendous interest in the enterorhinal cortex now, and because 
It's an area first affected in patients with cognitive disorders and Alzheimer's. So there's a tremendous amount of research going on involving. This is the rhinosulcus region, and this area here is the entorhinal cortex, which I'm showing here. This is this region over here. And we can identify this region well on coronal MR, and that's why it's so important to be able to identify it. You can see basically, in like number 22 is the region of the entorhinal cortex. That's the level of the amygdala here. Here it is on the, on the T1 image. So this is the entorhinal cortex. On the T1, again, we can see a little bit of it over here. There have been a large amount of studies to measure the size of this because this area, as I said, is the earliest area to atrophy and degenerate in cognitive disorders. So there's a tremendous amount of research going on and evaluating this area. This was a very complex, detailed, and well-devised uh, study to study the endorhinal cortex, and they here outlined it on specimen. You see the entorhinal cortex. There's also the perirhinal cortex of the medial part of the temporal lobe, and they showed how important the collateral sulcus is actually wanted to point it out over here because its size of the sulcus determines also the size of the entorhinal cortex itself. And here they diagram to show how the, the entorhinal cortex in red is determined to a large extent to the depth of the collateral sulcus here. And they just diagrammed it very nicely. So in conclusion, I've gone through all these structures of the limbic system, as you can see, a huge number of them uh, that we can identify on MR and uh, a, a part of this limbic system. And as MR progresses, I'm sure there'll be more and more interest of these extremely complicated components of the lim limbic system. And uh, here we again outline some of them by Netta on this sagittal diagram. And uh, I will again touch on some of these structures when I talk about the evolution of the brain and the development of the corpus callosum. Thank you for your attention.